This is, this is correctly restored as a Wabash station, but it's typical of the small town stations. Will County at one time had 35 or 40 little small town stations with 10 different railroads. Uh, and from the 1850s to the 1950s, the train station was really the front door of the community. Everything came and went by the train. You know, the, uh, the circus, the new school teacher, the package ordered from the Sears catalog, everything came on the train. You know, so the, uh, and the station agent, the, these stations are designed for one-man operation where he would be the, he could sell tickets, uh, check baggage, handle freight, telegrams, the railroad's business. So the station agent was an integral part of the, of the fabric of the railroad, but he was also an integral part of, of, of the community too. And actually how the agent conducted himself, for better or for worse, is how the, the municipality perceived the railroad. And, uh, uh, up until about 1900s, for a, rare, a station agent to move up, he had to move on. You, you start looking at the, the annual census for the cemeteries for the station agents, you can't find them. After 1900, they tended to stay put longer, longer periods of time. Some small town stations had quarters built into the station for the agent. Uh, that wasn't really common on this railroad. The, the Milwaukee Road and the Burlington, that was a little more common. There's a Burlington station up in Lyle Preserve that has quarters in it. So typically the agent would work 12 hours a day, six or seven days a week, and would just board with a local family within walking distance. Oh. And a small town station like this, there really no need, the, the overnight express trains from Chicago to Cater St. Louis to go through in the middle of the night, so there's really no reason to have an agent here, uh, you know, for, for two or three shifts. With, uh, but uh, he had, uh, to get the job, you had to be proficient with the, the telegraph, with Western Union, with, uh, Morris College with American Code. You're handling the telegraph business for both the railroad and for Western Union. Uh, you're handling mail, you're checking packages and for Railway Express Company, and handling package freight for the railroad. You know, so you had to be a pretty versatile individual. And uh, it, it, uh, a, a larger community like a county seat, like Joliet or Morris or whatever, or, they would have a big passenger station and a separate freight station. The small towns, they had to have a station, but uh, they, they really couldn't justify ha having multiple buildings. So this is a balloon frame type building. Uh, pretty much the standard Wabash Railroad design. Each railroad had its own particular style of station. The, if it was a, a college town with a lot of passenger business, you could extend the, uh, the building this way. If it had a lot of freight business, you could extend the building the other way. Okay. There's the preserved Rock Island station out in uh, Seneca. It was built in 1912 and then later expanded. Uh, that has been uh, preserved and is adapted for contemporary reuse. A lot of preserved stations have been adapted as museums or other purposes. And our intent with this is to keep it as, as original as possible. We're not a railroad museum, we're a county historical society. So the whole purpose of taking this back to its 19th century configuration is to uh, convey the appearance of what the station was at that time period. Uh, with the, the scale right here, uh, anything being shipped, the, the agent had to work out a, 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 a weight bill, which is the ticket to write. But, but uh, a given commodity, it, 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 the rate was based on uh, the commodity, the weight, and the distance it had to go. So if this is something you know, uh, bulk and heavy, you might have a lower rate. Something higher value would have a higher rate. Uh, but he, he, each commodity had a particular rate. So that w what the shipper paid to ship it was based on the commodity, the weight, and the distance it was going. The longer the distance or the more weight, obviously, the, the greater the, the rate was. I see you have a milk can here. And one thing I had heard that seemed kind of almost unbelievable to me was that farmers could drop their milk off at small stations like the Simmerton yeah. station and it would... Well, here, that would be handled on the freight side. There's a lot of chunk in here that doesn't belong here. For instance, if the farmer, he, he, he would take his cans of milk on his wagon and bring it up on the street side of the station and uh, the agent that would bring it into the station. When the train came, open door on that side, the, the brakeman and the agent would put it on the train. Okay. When the LP milk cans came back, they come in this side, go out that side, and it doesn't pretty much handle with any freight. If, if a merchant ordered uh, a bunch of merchandise, there, there was no UPS or FedEx. 
that came uh, with the railroad called less than car and lot freight. We'd have a boxcar on the local train that made all the stops. So whatever package was, you know, uh, small freight shipments, the train would stop, the brakeman would open the door and get brought in right here. The hardware store, the lumber yard, whatever the particular business was. And then when the, uh, the merchant came for it, they would come to this side and pick it up. You know, so this, uh, and this room wasn't heated, the, the stove was only on that side. But the typical small town combination station had the station agent's office in the middle with the bay window where you could look up and down the track from the approaching train. The freight house on one side and then the passenger waiting room and baggage room on the other side. And this has got, sometimes they were flipped around, but this is the typical floor plan of the small town uh, country station from, this station dates from 1882, but even from the 1850s. You get into the 1950s, you started seeing uh, U UPS, you started seeing interstate highways, and, and eventually the railroads got out of the package freight business. Uh, they, uh, back in the 60s, they quit handling package freight, they just handled whole carloads. The package freight business, it used to be very profitable, but it was very labor intensive. And usually a railroad would have what you call a house track. If somebody ordered a carload of lumber, the railroad the train would come by, set out the carload of lumber on the track next to the station, the train would leave. The local lumber yard would come and unload the lumber, haul it up to the lumber yard. And then the, when the car was empty, the railroad would pick it up and take it away. So I, that kind of strikes me, because I know if you go down to Champaign on 45, yeah. all of the small towns, their downtowns are you know, centered around the old Illinois Central. So does, is that an example of how they could? Well, pretty, well, the thing is, historically for thousands of years, development follows transportation. You go back to Europe a thousand years ago, everything was along rivers mm -hmm. and then canals uh, or, or the ocean ports. And the same thing with this country. In 1850, St. Louis was the center of the Midwest because it was on the Mississippi River and Chicago was a mud puddle. But gradually you got the Illinois and Michigan Canal and then the railroads, Chicago became the railroad hub of the Midwest by 1860 and it still is. You know, uh, a lot of communities, they started out as a canal town. And then the railroad came through, like, like if you've ever been out to Morris, the Illinois and Michigan Canal came through there. Morris was the county seat. Morris initially was all centered around the canal. Then the Rock Island came through, railroad came through in the 1850s, and the center of town kind of moved up to the railroad. Mm. And then the state highway came through, and the center of town kind of moved up to the, to the state highway. Then Interstate 80 came through, and now Morris is up around Interstate 80. Why does everybody want to be by the airport? You know, I mean, it's this has been going on for thousands of years. Development follows transportation. Mm. And with, uh, with the railroads, and like I said, along the Illinois Central downstate, everything is right there by the railroad because everything came and went. I mean, the circus came to town on the train. Yeah. The new school teacher came in the town. The package you ordered from the Sears catalog came on the train. The mail came on the train. Every, everything came and went. And uh, with, uh, with, the, with the waiting room here, you would buy a ticket and wait to get on the train or wait for somebody to get off the train. And of course, sometimes they'll play first person uh, interpretation here. And. Uh, my sister-in-law came up and said, I want to buy a ticket. And I said, well, have your husband and son come back later. And, you know, woman had no identity back then. Wow. I, I get to be a male soul of this pig in, in 1890. Would, they, would a station agent seriously not sell a ticket to a woman? No, they would, no of course not. But, I mean, a, a woman was either her, her father's daughter, her husband's wife, her children's mother. Mm. She had no identity of her own. Wow. So, she had no money. <laughs> from what, so this station, I, what year was it built in Sim? And from, was it staffed by a station agent from that time until when? Until about in the 1970s, 73, oh. 74. Well, this station, I can show you on the map, was right by the Joliet Arsenal. Okay. And it has business decline. And it's this, this blue line right through right here. This is the whole map of the county. Uh, the Simmerton station handled all the way bills and freight for traffic freight going to and from the arsenal. Yeah, right so the station in Custer Park or some of the other ones got, got shut down. This station stayed in business and was, it was around as long as it was because it handled all the 
the freight business for for the arsenal. What do you mean by handle the freight business? Well, there's a lot of freight coming, going, raw materials coming into the arsenal, finished finished ammunition coming out of the arsenal. Mm -hmm. Okay, all of that handled had to be handled by the uh, an agent for the railroad. Okay. And it was the agent at this station in Summerton that handled all of the freight business for the arsenal. Okay. So they would say, okay, we have five carloads of bombs headed north or... Yeah, whatever. With materials coming in and finished ammunition going out all had to be, you know, way billed, uh, billed to the railroad for the, the shipping bills, all the rest of that. All the paperwork was handled at this station. Mm. As the Vietnam wore down and the arsenal wound down for the last time, uh, but the agent, uh, there was agents in the station well into the 1970s. And what year was the station determined to be closed, or what would be the terminology? Uh, I believe that it was Norfolk and Western. That they quit staffing at around 75, I think. Okay. And then about 79, uh, they, they agreed to give it to the museum. Oh, okay. Uh, and it, as I said at one time, with all the different railroads in Will County, we use this map from 1967, because uh, I colored it all in. It shows all of the 10 different railroads that were operating here at one time. Since then, there's been changes of ownership, some abandonments, uh, and so forth. And today, there's uh, just relatively few stations uh, that are still left. The station in uh, Wilmington was just torn down a few years ago. Uh, the station in, in New Lenox, uh, Metro was going to tear it down. But the New Lenox Area Historical Society is paying to pick it up and have it moved off site. Uh, the, the, the station over here in Beecher has been preserved by the Washington Township Historical Society. Uh, the station at EJ and E station at Plainfield has been preserved by the Plainfield Historical Society. But the, each of these panels here is kind of a capsule history of each different, different railroads that serve okay. Rural County. And let's see. There was. The Milwaukee Road, did that also serve the arsenal? They had a spur, right? Yeah, they did. Uh, they, uh, well, they had two different lines in Wall County. Uh, they didn't build these lines, they purchased them. The uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Gary had this line from Joliet coming down into uh, 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 to, to Delmar, and then they also had this line here. Chicago, Terre Haute, and Southeastern, but coming through here right in Manhattan. Again, with the arsenal. This was the Milwaukee Road coming through this way. This is the Wabash coming through this way. And you can see it here barely. The, uh, the Milwaukee Road had trackage right parallel from here in Manhattan down into the arsenal. And then the Gulf Mobile in Ohio came right through the middle of the arsenal. And then the Santa Fe was over on the west side of the arsenal. So you really had four different railroads that had access to the arsenal. And does that show the um, the Milwaukee Road coming down to the arsenal and then going well, um, west onto Hoff? Or? Yeah, well, this, th this track here was actually the government railroad. The, the government owned the tracks all within the arsenal. Oh, okay. So the Milwaukee Road... Uh, they could come down this way on their own tracks to uh, drop off cars to the government railroad and the government would have their own locomotive to switch inside the, for security purposes. They, they didn't want railroad employees running around in the arsenal. Okay. So each of the, the Wabash and the Milwaukee Road would drop off and pick up cars here. Uh, the Gulf Mobile in Ohio would pick up cars over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my wife's like, well, I'm not being vegetarian. But the, the, the railroad itself, the, the arsenal had its own industrial railroad system. Uh, you know, all, all government employees and operated you know, by the Department of the Army. Okay. And so when the arsenal, would there be workers coming from using the Simmerton station to get to the arsenal? No, most, most of them commuted locally. Okay. So, and, and actually... Uh, as, as passenger service declined, I think the last passenger trains on this line were, were just from, they used to run Chicago to Decatur, St. Louis. The Wabash had a very competitive service from Chicago to St. Louis. But as you started getting competition, from, there's four railroads that serve Chicago to St. Louis. 
the Chicago Dome, which later became Beltmobile, Ohio. Uh, the, the Wabash, the Chicago and East Illinois, which later became uh, part of CSX, and the Illinois Central. So you had four railroads providing Chicago to St. Louis service. But as you get into the 1960s, uh, the demand for passenger service declined. And in the late 1960s, around 66 or 67, the post office decided to take the mail business away from the railroads. Used to be you paid extra for air mail. Mm -hmm. Service mail went by train and you paid extra for air mail uh, to fly it someplace. They eliminated air mail entirely. So anything going any real distance was flu and everything else went by truck. Uh, and, and the passenger trains weren't making money. The thing is, the, the mail business is what kept the passenger trains running. Once the post office took the mail business away from the railroads, they started taking off trains. They couldn't afford to operate a train at that big of a loss without the mail business. You know, and plus, the interstate highways got it completed. So little by little, the Chicago and East Illinois cut back its passenger service to be Chicago to Danville. Mm -hmm. The Illinois Central cut it back just to be Chicago to Springfield. The Wabash cut its back service to be just Chicago to Decatur, and only the Gulf Mobile, Ohio, continued to Chicago to St. Louis. They had the best route because it went through uh, not only through Joliet but through Bloomington, uh, Lincoln, Springfield, uh, and even today Am Amtrak continues to use the former Gulf Mobile, Ohio, right for the Chicago to St. Louis trains. Mm -hmm. And so this would have been the passenger. Is, yeah, would this have been like the kind of the back office for the, yeah, the station the agent? Passengers wouldn't come back here. Okay. Uh, the the agent would have his, his desk here. He'd step over the window to sell tickets. Uh, you got the safe here for the the company money and the railway oh, express wow. packages. Oh uh, wow. Paperwork. The tickets and whatever else you had would be in the cabinet here. And this is—is is this the original cabinet that was in Simmerton? As far as I know, yeah, it was here when you know we've refurbished it somewhat. But yeah, this is all the real deal from the Wabash. There's uh, talking about paperwork. You know, like this is a, a a shipping record for uh, two two trailers from uh, to the Simmerton station coming from Alabama. Is that real? Is that like? Oh yeah, this, this, is, this is all the real stuff here. This is the earliest picture we have of the depot when it was still in place. And we worked pretty much from this doing the restoration. Okay. But there's his own. All authentic. Egg. This is strictly for uh, company correspondence. It would be, you know, rather than put it in the U.S. mail, they would, they would just put it on the train to send it to wherever it was going on, on the railroad. Uh -huh. What they did is they went from town to town trying to sell to merchants and promote business. So that, that's where the term drummer comes from, the traveling salesman that had his sample cases of whatever it was he was selling to the general store, the drug store, the dry goods store, whatever. Uh, so they, they would go from, from town to town with their samples you know, at the local train. Mm -hmm. That's some of the original. Uh, with, uh, when I first went to the military, and, and, and at the uh, station agent, we'd be flying. If any it's local youngster, farm 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 boy, wanted uh, uh, didn't want to be a farmer, wanted to be interested in the railroad, he, he could come out of the station and, and, and help out, sweep up, do you can listen for do, do stuff. The agent would have to pay him, pay him himself. He could learn learn yeah, yeah, learning learning just like learning a foreign language. It's easier when you're a kid. The more you are, the harder it is to pick up a foreign language. Well, the thing is to get the job with the railroad. You had to already know. You had to pass the test that you knew the telegraph. So the thing is, 
So with parents of young kids, uh, let, letting your boy hang around the railroad, learn to become a railroader, uh, that was encouraged. So you, you get to learn, you know, how, how the world operates. You didn't let your daughter hang around the station. You know, they, you can't trust these drummers. Mm -hmm. So this would have looked out under the tracks, right? Yeah, yeah, well, the thing is, he could sit here and see up and down the tracks for an approaching train. Mm -hmm. They started putting bay windows in stations in the 1870s. Earlier stations didn't have them. The agent would have to go outside to take a look. And what's this? This is... Um... That's the earliest document we have for this station. Uh, from June 18, 1882, when the first station agent, uh, T.J. Gettler, was assigned to the station. And that's actually from Simmerton? Yeah, from, and that's, it says right here, second line, Simmerton, Illinois. And what is it saying? Do you, is it... Um... This is the document from the Wabash, and it was the Wabash St. Louis and Pacific Railroad Company at the time. So what, they changed the names a few times, the organization, but this is the document that uh, assigned that particular agent to this station oh, okay. with this effective date. And I notice it says the Blodgett. Is uh, that... This is from, oh. This is T.J. Gettler agent. Uh, document of St. Louis dated 6-15-1882 for Simmerton, agent for Simmerton, Illinois. And the rest of it goes through. Oh, okay. And uh, now the agent, uh, there was no time and a half or overtime. He, he was strictly salary. But the thing is, uh, he got commissions on the business he generated. And, uh, so the thing, uh, and also he got, if he generated uh, railroad business, for the freight, express business, packages, selling tickets, uh, he generated revenue for himself. He got, a, he got commissions. And one of the things, and I, I do it when I would do the role playing, I'd sell somebody some train tickets, and I said, well, you want to get the travel insurance, don't you? Okay. You always got commission on travel insurance, and they try like heck to sell travel insurance every time they sold tickets. So this, there would be, <clears throat> how many times a day would a train stop that passengers could get on? Uh, er, early on, uh, uh, more contemporary times into the early 20th century, maybe two a day each direction. There'd be other trains. The express trains wouldn't stop. The express trains wouldn't stop at the small towns, for instance. Uh, there'd be a local, they call it a combination train, that made all of the stops. Yeah. Yeah. This is a Wabash timetable from 1956. Mm -hmm. It shows all the fares and the train times. And Let's see here. St. Louis, Chicago, Decatur. So you had one, two, three. You had five trains that, right, that went past Summerton. Now, the, the, this train here, number 12, originated at Decatur. And made all of the stops all the way down and got to Chicago at Dearborn Station at 7:10 in the morning. Yeah. Th this train here, number 18, left St. Louis at 11:30 at night. Made a few stops, got into Dearborn Station at 6:50 in the morning. This train over here left at 2 in the afternoon, got to Chicago at 7:30, and then this train here left at 8:55 in the morning. Uh, got to Chicago at 2.05 in the afternoon. Okay. But you can see, that, uh, this is 1956. But the thing, and, and these through trains, they would have reclining seat coaches, they'd have a dining car, a lounge car, first class, uh, you know, parlor car. The overnight trains would have Pullman sleeping cars. The, this train here would be mainly express cars and, you know, ju just a coach. They wouldn't have any diner. And for the people that rode it, they were just going to and from intermediate stations. And the same thing in the evening. I left at 4.40 p.m. from Dearborn Station, made all the stops, got back to Decatur at 8.27 p.m. But this is 1956. In earlier years, there would have been more trains. Okay. Oh, wow, there's the Ritchie Depot. Yeah. No, that, I've heard of, that is 
It's off 102 now at a farm, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, and these are just a few pictures we copied and put up here for the exhibit. And the thing is, steam locomotives had to stop for water. Mm -hmm. And all of, uh, from downtown Chicago. And the Wabash, they stopped in Manhattan. And the Illinois Central, uh, they stopped at Homewood or Kankakee. And the Rock Island, or the Santa Fe, they had to stop in Joliet. For the Burlington, they had to stop in Aurora. You know, so a community that had at a water stop like this, like mm -hmm. Manhattan, they'd have a bigger station and a, and a water spout to uh, uh, refill the, the locomotives. That was later replaced in the 1940s by this, this station, which was torn down, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Okay. Uh, but that was a standard Wabash kind of a pillbox design station. It was all precast concrete. They just brought it out, stuck it together, and put them there. And at the, in the late 1940s, they had to have a station a lot of the old stations were falling apart and they couldn't justify maintaining a big, huge station. So a lot of the railroads in the late 1940s built small new replacement stations that were much smaller than the original. The Illinois Central and Piaton, the original Piaton station was this great big thing that later got replaced by this one. Much smaller. Yeah. And, uh, and still you had the bay window in the front for the station agent, the freight house on one side, the passenger waiting room on the other side. Uh, this is the original Monet station. Uh, that got replaced in the 1920s by this station, which is also gone. And originally Monet was the top of the hill. The Illinois Central built straight from Chicago uh, on the Chicago branch of the Illinois Central. Uh, but Monet was a, on a hilltop. And they spent an awful lot of money getting freight trains up and down that hill. After World War, after World War One, the, the, uh, the federal government took over the railroads during World War One. Once the Illinois Central got the railroad back from the federal government, if you've ever been in Moni, the railroad is in the yes. cut. Yes, they cut. Uh, they, they cut right through here into the cut, and this is the new station built after the cut was built. And this would have been the passenger waiting room. Yeah, this would be the passenger waiting room where the passengers would come in, buy their ticket, wait for the train, or and this is the uh, wait for somebody to get off the train. The overall map, correct? Yeah, and that dates from about 1905. Wow. That's pretty amazing that all those little towns are on this map. And I've had people look at it and say, well, it's a way out of proportion. Uh-huh. You got Illinois bigger than Nevada or California. Uh-huh. This isn't geography, it's advertising. It's okay. Marketing. Railroad maps always made their railroad look favorable. You know, I mean, Illinois here is huge. Illinois is bigger than Utah, Arizona, and Nevada combined, just about, uh -huh. on this map. But this is advertising and marketing. And it's they almost not, had to make it so they could have all the towns there, too, yeah. I would think. And Simmerton is right in, in this area right here. Huh. Wow. This is, <clears throat> did you have to do a lot of work to preserve it or was it pretty well? Well, yeah, it was, when it was first moved, it was disassembled and reassembled board by board and a lot of the boards ended up in the wrong places. And the original, the 20th century railroad color, the Wabash Railroad, was kind of a certain green color. When we had it painted, they didn't paint the inside of the cabinet. This is the color of the whole station when we oh, okay. first got it. But the thing is, uh, little by little on the inside, it was kind of some forensics. We wanted to paint. I came down here with a power sander because there's a lot of paint saves and nail holes and a lot of prep work before we paint. Every time I, I started sanding through that, that served green paint, I mm -hmm. found this color underneath. And I found this under, underneath down here. Okay. So by doing some forensic investigation, we came to the conclusion that these were the correct 19th century colors. Oh, okay. So not that they, this is accurate for the 1890s, that they would be spiked well, right to the tie? And in terms of rail, rail is uh, described by its weight per yard. As the trains get heavier, the rails had to get heavier. What's out here in the railroads today with the heavy trains is at least 130 pounds, 145 pound per yard rail. For this, this is 65 pound rail. 
from period correct for that time period. And it's got rail joints where today's track is all welded. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. The rail sections are 39 feet, and they had to have a joint every, you know, every 39 feet. I see. The railroad ties today are seven inches wide, nine inches, seven inches deep, nine inches wide, and about six feet long. The ties here are smaller and, and, and more widely spaced, so that even the ties that spikes the rails are all period correct for the 1890s. Wow. Yes, in some of the, the creeks and the little drainage ditches next to the Waponzi Trail, yeah. you'll see the spikes, and I've seen a few rail plates too. Yeah, we'll land around, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say thank you to Bill for taking the time to record this video and provide so much great information about the Simmerton Depot. And I also just wanted to point out that here, kind of on the right of the building, is the door where the freight would have been collected. So you can see the freight is on the right hand of your screen, and then on the left you can see the door where the passengers would have entered. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.